Yeah, so um, I think this is an important topic, uh, particularly for you guys who are dealing with uh, trauma stories and nourishment stories, because you're going to see a fair, your fair share of addictive disorders, particularly sexual addiction, and we'll get to the reasons why here. But let me give some basics about sex addiction, which has some controversy around it. Uh, those for both people in the lay public and uh, uh, professional people and Either you get the, the snickering, you know, I wish I had a sex addiction or the, you know, there's no such thing as a sex addiction. So you get these extremes. So let, let me give you the, the brief um, state of the art, if you will, state of the science. So there is now an official diagnostic category in the World Health Organization ICD manual. So which we don't use in the States, we use the, the DSM, which does not have a sex addiction or sexually compulsive category, they determined there wasn't enough evidence or there wasn't enough um, <clears throat> um, agreement on criteria. I think it's only a matter of time we'll see. But let me say what the let me say what the World Health Organization has said about this. They say that there are people who have what they have termed officially and diagnostically as a compulsive sexual behavior disorder. So we have an official diagnosis out there, which is been a hard fought victory for those of us who have been dealing with this population for a long time. Now, there's some pieces of that definition that I think are important for your listeners to know. Particularly, you know, if we're talking to groups of uh, people coming from re religious backgrounds, who oftentimes may overuse the sex addiction label as a morality policing label. And I want to, the, the definition from the World Health Organization makes a clear distinction. It says that the behavior must be repetitive. It, you must have over six months or more. It must include efforts to stop, failure to stop despite negative consequences, and it cannot be solely defined. This is important for your religious audience. It cannot be solely defined by um dissatisfaction morally that is not addiction now you have a conflict to deal with you have an issue to deal with or if somebody says geez I, I looked at porn once in the last year and i feel morally you know i really feel ashamed um that is not addiction i've had people walk into my office who have had and i'm not saying you should run off and use porn or do whatever you want. Don't get me wrong. I don't want your listeners to hear that. But we want to be careful when we use the word addiction. Because then the addiction becomes a way to police morality. And so anything that doesn't fit into heteronormative norms gets called an addiction. And the addiction professionals say, don't even think about it because you, you, you contaminate our efforts to make this a legitimate diagnosis. If if a group of people are using it to 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 shame or corral what they feel is immoral, then it then it diminishes the effort to make it scientific. But it doesn't. So somebody could have a occasional conflict with their sexuality. Geez, I noticed somebody who's attractive other than my partner, you know, and I'm in a moral conflict. Okay, that's something they take to their rabbi or they sort of work through themselves, but they don't go to a 12 step meeting for sex addiction because they found somebody else attractive. So you've got to differentiate when I have a moral conflict, an issue that sort of rubs me the wrong way about how I'm experiencing my sexuality. We'll get to that in a minute. I have an answer for you. Or do I have an addiction, which now requires, so addictions do not respond to increase moral efforts. That's the important difference. And I, I love your I love the way you did that. And that's exactly right. So we have people who are sexually addicted six months more repetitive can't stop because negative consequences, even though I've tried. And the distress is not related to moral uh, rejection, although sex addicts do violate the value system and they do have moral conflict. So it's part of this. It's part of the package. 
but you can't by itself doesn't define it. So that those people could we've we've seen very spiritual religious people in those categories have very strong moral compasses. And you say to yourself, my goodness, how can they find themselves in an in, excuse me, in another way doing what they're doing? So let's So I, I come back to my definition. So first of all, it's not defined by which behaviors I do. <clears throat> it's, it's defined by the inability to stop and the repetitiveness of it and the negative consequences and in spite of the negative consequences that last over six months, I can't stop it. It's not about whether it's masturbating to porn or picking up sex workers or lusting after your neighbor. It's not a behavior. It's not defined by which behaviors that is important for you and your audience to understand. So somebody can compulsively masturbate 10 times a day and they can't stop. Somebody might masturbate. And I know that's a difficult thing to talk about in religious circles, but let me just say it. Or somebody might be looking on their Internet and, and they hit a button to look at their, I don't know, you know, sports stars and they get Sports Illustrated and they quickly look over at the swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated. And next thing you know, there's another thing that pops up that's a, a naked person. And oh, geez, you know, I, I've, I'm, I've spent a half hour here. Let me get off of here. Is that person a sex addict? No. Is it potentially a violation of their of their moral commitments or their or their fidelity commitments? Perhaps. But by itself, it's not an addiction. Six months, repetitive, repetitive efforts to stop, the inability to stop. And moral distress by itself doesn't define it. So the, the definition is the following. Repetitive compulsive behavior and negative consequences. And in spite of it, over the course of six months, I can't stop it. That is your better definition, not which behaviors. So you can get all the way from masturbating to porn, to picking up sex workers, affairs, um, and everything in between. Well, yes, that's a good question because you do get, you do, you do, so now, now you're talking about differentiating diagnostic categories. So we have, let's say we have the narcissistic client who is charming, uh, opportunistic and seductive and he he um, or she uh, might have multiple relationships affairs but they don't try to stop they don't have negative consequences they have no shame I'm going to go over the addictive cycle for you in a minute which always involves shame they're just narcissistically opportunistic and so they are they may have a compulsive pattern but not be addicted in the way we just defined it. So you get people like that, or you get people at the early stage of their addictive cycle who are compulsive, repetitive, but they haven't hit negative consequences to try to stop yet. So you might be witnessing an early phase of an addictive process. Better to use the word pattern or compulsive at those moments to see if it resonates with the client. Let's, let's walk right into the thick of it, the arousal template. Everybody has one. so. Why is it a problem and, and how does it become a problem with sex and porn addiction versus what we just try to talk about normative or non problematic. Sometimes people use the phrase problematic or non problematic sexual behavior, which is another way to say this. So here's the difference. Those who are addicted are fixed, rigid and obsessional. They're maladaptive and inappropriate. They use sex to deal with anger, loneliness, d dysregulation, numbness. So sex becomes its own drug. They violate their values and they violate other people's boundaries. So again, compulsive pattern over six months. Here's your definition. I won't repeat that. We've done that a number of times. So in the field uh, of professionals, we get a lot of pushback, not a lot. We get some pushback that sex cannot become addictive. And I, I'm not sure who they're talking about, but what we're beginning to get more and more clarity about is the neuroscience that indeed the brain can get flooded and addicted to more than just chemicals. So let's take a look at how that happens just briefly. We won't make this a talk on neuroscience, but this is important. 
<clears throat> because addiction is always happening in the brain. It's a reward system maladaptive response. So it begins as pleasure, right? And so all the pleasure activities cause the release of dopamine. And then over time, there's an excessive amount of dopamine from very stimulating stimuli. So if I keep looking at the same porn and I'm on the and I'm on the computer looking at porn images or I'm texting or and I'm spending hours at a time flooded with erotic stimuli, uh, my dopamine is is releasing in the reward um, centers of the brain, right? And now I'm conditioned to that response, right? So in the in the brain, in this case, the hippocampus campus is recording the memories. It's recording the high. Right. And so now the computer comes on and I get aroused. I don't even have to have this. I don't even have to have an image anymore. Right. So we have people reporting these. Now they become very hypersexualized. And this is what's happening. It's happening in the brain. <clears throat> so this repeated use over time overstimulates and they call it down regulation of dopamine, which basically means that it's not working anymore, that I'm not getting high anymore. I'm not getting my mood alteration anymore. There's too much dopamine. The receptors have shut down. They flooded and they say, I can't take it anymore. So we, we become overloaded. It no longer produce the pleasurable response. So here we, we get we often see people walking into the clinic under these conditions. Now, other normal sources of pleasure don't produce a noticeable impact either. In other words, I'm not getting aroused by my spouse anymore either. So now the addiction is interfered with other arousing stimuli. <clears throat> and even though, and this is the thing about the memory system, even though the drug or the behavior produces less arousal, so we've got guys who are going, I, I just hear stories all the time of people, I can't get aroused anymore. I knew the police were waiting for me. They're not experiencing the arousal in the moment, but the brain is recalling it. It says, I know it's out there. Because you see that with addicts, right? You think to yourself, what were they thinking? What do you mean you blew your last mortgage payment on the bet, right? The, the brain is called the hijacked brain. It's that the, the memory system knows that that high is out there and I'm going to keep searching for it until I get it. And that's when you begin to see addicts begin to break boundaries and do things that they swore they would never do. So now we have a conditioned response. We call it the addictive response. <clears throat> we have wanting and seeking behavior and we have a decoding of past negative consequences, meaning that I forget how shameful I felt when I got caught with a sex worker and got arrested. My brain has lost track of that. All I'm remembering is the high. I want more. So addiction's always happening in the brain. And those people who aren't addicted, that's when you get people shaking their heads and going, didn't you, didn't you see that was a, a sting operation? And you get, you get these recovering addicts who are getting in recovery and they'll tell you, yeah, I knew it was a cop, but I couldn't stop myself. This is what it is right here. This is exact. I knew I had to work in the morning and it was five o'clock and I was still on the computer looking at porn, but I couldn't stop. Because the brain is seeking that high and I'm gonna keep seeking it until I get it. And I'm decoding that negative consequence. That's a that's a nice way to say it. That's a nice way to say it. Absolutely. And, and in some ways, that's an evolutionary built in uh, piece of our, our humanity, right? We, we want to stay positive. We don't want to remember the bad things It keeps the species going to some extent, right? Um, so but that's, that's a nice way to say it. Let, let's take a quick look at the addictive system because this is important. So this is where so this is the complicated system of addiction that we that Pat Carnes, Dr. Pat Carnes, um, uh, delineated in his work out of um, 
out of the shadows, the first book on sexual addiction that was out there. And he said that addicts, sex addicts had a core belief system. Like I can't, nobody can be trusted. Sex is my most important need. My, my needs are never gonna be met. You know, kind of an intimacy disorder sort of belief system, right? That intimacy can't be trusted. And certainly when we look at the history of, of addicts, sex addicts, we see a lot of, of uh, trauma. We'll get to that in a minute. And then we have an impaired thinking. You know, what's my, my, I'm not violating my spouse. I'm not actually having sex. I'm just masturbating over, uh, and I don't want to offend anybody in your audience, but I, I don't know how else to say it. I, I'm having sexual contact over the internet with somebody live across the country, but I call it not having sex, but in fact, you really are having sex. So there's always an impaired thinking process that gives me permission and entitlement to keep doing what I'm doing. So then I get preoccupied. Then I start thinking about that person I want to get, and I text her or him all day long. And now I, I can't wait to get home and get back on the computer. I'm angry with my wife or my husband because they're getting in my way. Why don't you guys just go to bed? I'm going downstairs. I don't want to be bothered. I'm going to turn that computer. I have work to do, right? But really, you're in your ritual. So there's a highly ritualized sort of behaviors. And at this point in the process, the frontal lobes are offline. I'm not thinking about consequences. So when we work with, with uh, treatment of sex addiction, we really have to be working up top here in the part of the system. So then you get the compulsive behavior. It's five o'clock in the morning. I haven't been to bed yet. I, I wake up my wife. She wants to know what I'm doing downstairs. Are you, are you looking at porn again? No, I start lying. Uh, I go to work. I can't function. So I have this shame and guilt. So what do, what do addicts do who have shame and guilt and have no recovery going on? Well, they try to get over this. And they, the reason they get over this, the way they get over this is just to do it again. Because then they get into a fight with their partner and they say, see, I can't, I can't get along with anybody. I might as well just go back to my addiction. So this addictive system um, really um, can go on for a long period of time. This is a chart uh, done by a colleague of mine, Dr. Alex Katahakis, out of her book called Erotic Intelligence. <clears throat> I'm not going to read it all. Your your clients can, um, your audience can take a look at it, at, you know, another time, or you guys can send it to them. But it's a nice because people begin to ask, well, what, what's addictive versus what's healthy? This is a very this is a very powerful uh, chart. I think this chart should be up in everybody's office. I, I've been teasing my colleague to get a, to make this into a poster. So addictive sexuality feels shameful, healthy, fosters self-worth. Addictive has illicit, stolen, or exploitive, has no victims. Addictive sexuality compromises values. Healthy operates within value system. Addictive sexuality draws on fear for excitement, uses intimacy for excitement. Addictive sexuality reenacts childhood abuse versus healthy sexuality cultivates a sense of being an adult. Addictive sexuality disconnects oneself versus fostering. So you get the, you get the temple, right? It's really, it's a really brilliant chart in my mind. It really sort of, it's the best chart I've ever seen that really, really says it like it is. Um, just to get a couple more, addictive sexuality is dishonest, creates a double life, healthy originates in integrity, Addictive sexuality, routine, grim, joyless, healthy sexuality, spontaneous, fun, playful. Addictive sexuality demands perfection. I got to have it my way. It's got to be ritualized. I have to be in control. And I can't get aroused unless it's ritualized and I'm in control. Versus healthy sexuality, there's a permission, it's, it's relational. It's imperfect. So we're, we're beginning to see in this chart that sex addicts have an intimacy disorder, a, a trauma-based intimacy disorder, that they, they, they find it difficult to be relational. And so sexual compulsion becomes a compensation. I can't be relationally sexual 
over here because I feel inadequate or I come from an abused background or an mesh background and I feel trapped over here. So if I come from an mesh background, I often feel intimacy to be smothering, too intrusive. Yeah, so so I, I began to say that if you're if you come from an enmeshed background where you've been intruded on, engulfed, smothered, um, even neutered, if we can use that word, by a parent or a family system, when I move into an adult relationship, a romantic one, an intimate one, it isn't long before I experience my partner's needs, wants, desires as too much. You too are now smothering me. You too are being too demanding. So they, they transfer that experience that they had with a parent onto their spouse. Sometimes they may pick a spouse who is like that, or they may provoke a spouse to become like that by betraying them. But they, they typically experience, no matter who they're with, difficulty with commitment, difficulty with holding on to themselves. So I'm going to please you. I'm going to sacrifice myself. So now when it's time to be erotic, I can't really show up because I have no sense of self, right? Sex addiction looks very attractive because I can go to a sex worker, I can go to a porn image, I can go to a texting friend, I can even have an affair where there's no emotional responsibility. Now I'm free, not really, but sex addiction looks like freedom to an enmeshed adult. So if you look at a contemporary sex addict, well, I want to differentiate this for a minute here. So here, here's your enmeshed, enmeshed man or your trauma survivor sitting in fresh start. History of abuse, insecure, insecure attachment. So even though I've been enmeshed and smothered, I'm still insecure, poor impulse control, cross addictions, comorbid mood disorders, depression, anxiety, very common. So now my addiction is used to soothe. I use it to soothe my inability, my anxiety, my depression, my numbness. I use it as an escape when I feel smothered, when I'm being too demanded on by my partner. I, it, it serves as a multi-layered a multi-triggered experience that ironically reassures me that I still have myself. That's why it's so seductive with a meshed and otherwise abused adults, which is a, a nod to your program. Of course, you guys are dealing with this stuff right here, right? It for a start, you're managing, helping them manage this. So in addiction recovery, and we'll get to this in a minute, you need both addiction treatment and you need trauma treatment. You need enmeshment recovery and you need addiction recovery. You need trauma recovery and you need addiction recovery. You can't do, one of the mistakes of my well-educated um, and well-meaning trauma colleagues is they think that if they deal with the underlying trauma, the addiction will go away. It certainly helps, but it might also trigger the addiction. And you really need addiction management behavioral strategies that, that are parallel to your trauma work or my well-meaning addiction folks will forget to do the trauma work and they think just by doing behavioral intervention or addiction intervention. So you can have a sex and love addict who is very preoccupied with making attachments, but needs to do it in a more detached avoidant way. So one of the things that has helped me when I think about labels like addiction, sex addiction or love addiction is to think about attachment styles. Attachment styles almost give you more information. So what, when you talk about love avoidant, you're talking about an attachment style that's avoidant. When you're talking about um, love addicted, you're talking about an anxious attachment style, a preoccupied anxious attachment style. A sex addict can be both. So I like attachment styles as a, as a kind of a placeholder. And, and yes, 
your classic, your contemporary sex addict. Now, contemporary means that there's a history of abuse and the sex addiction is an outcome of the trauma, been going on a long time, basically an intimacy disorder. And so what you'll see is you see a avoidant behavior with the prime, this is again, generalization, avoidant behavior, what you call love avoidant with the primary partner, but preoccupation in love or sexual obsession with others. So it really doesn't serve you to call the sex addict love avoidant. A part of his, his part of his template is avoidant, but not the whole story. So you can see right away that label cuts off a piece of data. And so, um, so this is the, so let's look at this history of abuse, which is really what you guys are working on treating, which is so good because you need these trauma treatment experiences. And if you look at the studies on sex addiction, addicts come from families in which there's multiple addiction. They tend to come from rigid family systems, autocratic, this is the way I'm in charge and you're not. And they tend to be emotionally disengaged. Not a lot of warm fuzzies going on. Love is transactional in a mesh systems Although the mesh system can feel warm on the surface, it sometimes love is transactional. You're obligated to me, and if you don't, you don't act in the role that I need you in. I withhold love. So pretty soon, love becomes transactional. So you have emotional disengagement. So not surprising, 68% of sex addicts report coming from rigid and disengaged family systems in those disengaged systems is always some enmeshment by the way there's a subtext in those look at this look at the amount of abuse reported by sex addicts this is this comes from pat Carnes's study of 1100 um, sex addicts over five years of recovery 97 percent reported emotional abuse 81 percent report sexual abuse 72 percent report physical abuse high high abuse patterns in the, in the classic sex addict, trauma, long-term, multiple behaviors, usually multiple addictions, one size doesn't fit all. So you're gonna get in, in fresh start a degree of this kind of client, right? Now, just to give, and so this is a simplistic way, I may have shown you this chart before. This is a simplistic way to show it. Here's your public self, and this can be a highly moral, religious, upstanding citizen, right? Could be a religious leader. Everybody thinks is morally upright, but below the water surface, if we had water here, we got a story. There may be a vulnerable little girl, a little boy in there that's hurting. And then there's a protector, an addict who says, never again am I gonna get close to anybody. This part acts out in secret. So I show the world a part of me, but below the surface is a story. And, and what happens in treatment and in, in what you guys are doing in, in Fresh Start is you're helping people come to terms with their story, right? You're allowing this vulnerable piece of them to emerge in where they don't need as much protective, they don't need their protector, their addict to come to their rescue. Now, having said that, you still need to put some boundaries around that addict. So we've chatted before about, you know, making sure that you've got people in some degree of recovery if they're coming in and so forth. I want to make one distinction for you, because um, some of your audience members may be, may be listening and, and say, well, you know, I don't have an abusive background. My family is pretty loving. Yeah, they're a little enmeshed, but they, they respect my independence. I don't have any trauma. Sometimes that's true. So we have a new group of people last 10 years younger, more technology savvy, who exposure by itself to the explosive internet, uh, a sexual availability. So anything you want to think about sexually is out there. There's nothing you could imagine. And then some it's not out and available to you. Curiosity, mild depression, mild stress, mild poor social skills, maybe difficulty with my college exams, getting online, getting a little curious. In six weeks or six months, you can see a full-blown addiction, 
based on sexual conditioning and exposure just by itself. That person does typically not need trauma work. They need the behavioral boundaries. So just, just to make a note for your audience, there is a subgroup that does not have the classic story. So here's, here's just a, you guys have this on your website, Pathos. So your, your clients can go to your website and take a look at this. You know, it, uh, one to two yeses indicate a sexual, problematic sexual behavior issue. Do you find yourself preoccupied, hide your sexual behavior, sought help? Anyone been hurt, feel controlled? You can see right away, you can feel the addictive aspect to this. Um, so let's just talk briefly, and then I know we're coming to an end shortly. <clears throat> let's talk about what it's like to be married or involved with a sex addict. It's trouble. Yeah, so I wanted to, I didn't want to leave them out because they're, they're in the audience listening going, what about me? And these, these individuals have been betrayed um, and trust has been broken and they suffer acute distress and often being gaslighted or told they're crazy or blame themselves or, or been for, or coerced into joining in threesomes or something that they don't want to do. And so partners of sex addict have a set of symptoms and issues that are directly related to the acting out behavior that needs its own trauma treatment. And we've, you guys have had a few clients in Fresh Start who have had some of this. So this is, this is where trauma treatment would occur. These folks have acute distress as a result of the betrayal. If they come from families in which there was betrayal or trauma themselves, then the distress that they have in the marriage activates a previous distress and then you have double duty here. And we have trauma uh, experiences that sort of begin to coalesce around the past and you have a, you have a very difficult set of circumstances. You have to be very careful because if you tell the partner that, well, the reason you're having such intense reactions is because your father betrayed your mother, they'll feel like you've been, they'll feel that you've dis dismissed their reality, that no, I'm reacting to my husband betraying me. So you have to be very careful not to do that. Having said that, it's more complicated for the spouse who has had both. They need a lot of validation and they need a lot of trauma treatment. And you guys would really come in handy. Here's their traumas, the discovery of the secrecy, the details of the secrecy, the lying, the disclosure, the staggered, meaning I'm gonna tell you what happened, but I'm not gonna tell you everything. So, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, it was your sister too. Staggered disclosure is very common, very painful and very difficult. Gaslighting, you're crazy. I wouldn't be doing this if you were more sexy. And then relapse, these are significant trauma. So you can see the partner is under great distress here for a variety of reasons. These are just some resources for your audience that they can go to. Yeah, we've seen that happen and it gets a little, the, the partner becomes a, a version of a sex slave. And um, it's very troubled because it's, it's sanctioned by typically, we see this in religious circles, whether Christian or Jewish or whatever, in which the religious um, is used, the religion is used to sanction that. And, and oftentimes it, it's really a traumatic for the spouse. I've had some pretty, um, pretty difficult stories that I've heard around that. A little trickier to parse out because of the religious aspect to it. Acceptance is the key to all change, right? So breaking through denial and coming to terms with the truth of what's going on is obviously your first step. So there's a variety of ways to break through denial, you know, education, books, videos, uh, self-help tests, 
going to a therapist and starting to come to terms with what are you dealing with. So, um, and then getting on the path of recovery where you start dealing with containment of your addictive behavior and you begin to create some abstinence from those behaviors that are addictive. So we talk about creating an abstinence or a sobriety plan, which are which behaviors are permissible from which are not. And, and then to begin to deal with, with the heavy lifting of the trauma story and the intimacy disorder, learning to, learning to take a deep breath and learn to get comfortable with being next to your partner's body, learning next, being next and intimate with your partner, looking at her or him in the eyes. So moving past that, uh, uh, what you call love avoidant behavior, Gail, where you, you have to really, that's really the hard lifting. I mean, it's all difficult, but it's possible. It's so that, so that what addicts and trauma survivors learn is they learn how to make love in recovery. Because sex with the sex worker is a drug, ritual, control, power, emotional detachment, you know, where I'm in charge and it's strictly about my mood alteration and it's non-relational. So you can, ex with that ritualistic behavior, you can create a high, whereas with your partner, it requires letting go, vulnerability, tenderness, which is its own learning curve with trauma survivors and addicts. All of it's possible. So it's acceptance, education, breaking through denial, getting on the path of recovery, dealing with your trauma story and your intimacy issues, and leaning into tenderness and vulnerability as the new lover in town. Loving for love's sake versus what can I get from you? So sexuality and love becomes its own become it's it, it's for its own sake i share this with you my beloved for the sake of loving not what i can get out of it yes yeah, so that's 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 its own that's its own separate uh discussion and webinar we could do um it's a it's a it's a harder road because here's what we see so there's there's so much acute distress because of the lying the gaslighting and the sexual betrayal so you got three heavy hitters there right i mean all of them are difficult and in the end you almost always hear the partner say once i get past some of it if they can uh i, I it's the lying that really bothered me now i don't know what to trust right i can see that you're in recovery so oftentimes the addict will get relief. Thank goodness, I'm telling my story. I'm getting help. I'm dealing with my trauma. Honey, don't you love me now? She's still stuck in, she's still stuck in her acute distress. It takes, oftentimes a partner are delayed because they need to witness the legitimate recovery process for a period of time of their partner before they can start to lower their defenses. In the meantime, they need to get validation, they need to get support, they need to help them feel less crazy that it's not their fault. Um, they need to learn their own self-regulation so they're not throwing lamps across the, the room and or calling up work. And we've had partners call up work and get their their addict husbands or fired from their job and, and they're broke, you know, out of their own dysregulation and desire for revenge or retribution or something that is fair to me, right? I want other people know, to know you're really this. So you have to help them regulate while still speaking up for themselves. So that's a, that's a difficult process. And, and then if it, if it does active, and that's where trauma work can come in, straightforward trauma work. And if it does activate a previous trauma story, then you've got a deeper dive to do. And then at some point, there's a difficult decision. Do I want to recommit to this individual? And, and if so, what does that new contract look like? Typically, there are check-ins once a week. I want to know what's going on with your recovery. I don't want to police you, but I'd like you to be transparent with me. And if you relapse, I want to know, 
and sometimes partners do different things to protect themselves. They split money, they do different things. They create a safety plan for themselves. So addicts create a recovery sobriety plan. Partners create a safety plan. It is quite similar. You see brain, you see the alterations in the dopamine system, particularly in process addictions. The reward centers are affected by both behaviors and chemicals where there's the word I was looking for earlier is satiation. It no longer stimulates. And so that's why you see addicts doing things you just can't believe, whether it's sex or drugs. Um, and yes, there's often trauma stories behind addictions. And addiction is a compulsive disorder. It's not a it's not an immoral behavior, even though it does violate moral values. And that part of recovery is reintegrating my value system. But addiction is across the board uh, a behavior a, a brain disorder that has a combination of reward, memory system issues, and so forth that needs treatment.